Okay, um, I think I should, it's time for us to start. Um, so welcome to day two of the second kinds of intelligence workshop. This is a series of workshops we're holding in lieu of a, a conference due to the uh, pandemic. Uh, we had a fantastic day yesterday with symposium and a, and a great talk from um, Eric Schwitz-Gable. Um, and we've got another brilliant lineup today uh, with talks um, from David Gamez and Charles uh, um, Rathkopf, followed by our keynote of the day by Matea Yamnik. To start things off, uh, just a couple of quick announcements. We are, this is being recorded and we do hope to make the recordings available um, to you shortly, as well as the recordings of our previous workshop. Um, just a few uh, technical issues to making sure we are GDP, GDPR compliant and so on before we make them available to the public. Um, also, all presentations that have been made available to us by speakers will be available at the link that I'm now posting in the chat. So for anyone who finds it um, easier or more handy to have the presentation um, usable in that format, um, that's uh, for you. Oh, and also a final note that uh, as I'm sure you've all realized we are, this is a delayed start compared to that that was originally advertised as a, a couple of weeks ago, unfortunately, Mahi Hadalupas had to pull out. So we're hence the three o'clock start. Okay, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our first speaker in our short talk session, which who is David Gamez. David Gamez is a senior lecturer at the Department of Computer Science at Middlesex University. He's one of the world's leading experts on machine consciousness and artificial consciousness and has published several books, including Human and Machine Consciousness and What We Can Never Know. The current focus of his research is the development of a uni new universal measure of intelligence. Over to you, David. All right, okay. Well, thanks, uh, thanks uh, Ali and Henry, for putting this all together. Um, okay, great. So uh, let me just try and let's share this thing. We just tested it, so it should work. Yeah, okay. So, oh, come on. Uh, uh, okay, great. Can you see that, guys? Yeah, can you hear me as well, yeah? Yep, okay, everyone's gone silent, yeah? All righty, uh, okay, so my name's David Gomez, thank you for the introduction. Um, so yeah, like, I guess it's gonna be like a 25 minute talk, yeah? So it's got a lot of stuff in it, but there's a kind of, there's an accompanying website. So if you're interested in more details, you can always you know, check out the papers or the code or whatever, yeah? Okay, so I'm gonna flick through um, some previous definitions of intelligence. Um, actually, there's a rather good Leg and Hutter paper on that I've been reading this morning. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about the relationship so between prediction and intelligence. So I don't think any of the previous de definitions work very well. Therefore, you know, we need a new approach. My approach is all about the relationship between prediction and intelligence. And then once you've sort of nailed down intelligence sort of more precisely, then you can actually design nice algorithms to kind of measure it. I'm gonna outline the work I've done in that area, suggest a few applications and wrap it all up, yeah. Okay, so, you know, as a, you know, this Leg and Hutter paper I was reading this morning and that kind of does a survey of all the different definitions of intelligence, there's about 70 of them, yeah, and they sort of overlap to some extent um, and even potentially contradict each other to some extent, yeah, so kind of like that Bartholomew book on intelligence, and he has this sort of list of cognitive ability, rational thinking, problem solving, goal-directed adaptive behavior. So particularly in the work of Leg and Hutto, that they universal algorithm based on goals, but also in this sort of broader list that they share of about 70 definitions, the idea of achieving goals and receiving rewards from the environment is you know, quite popular amongst kind of definitions of intelligence. Yeah? And there are sort of algorithms kind of based on that, yeah? But I think goals and rewards really work if we're trying to make something that kind of works. And we, so what I'm looking for here, by the way, is a definition of intelligence that works from humans, animals, and artificial systems. Yeah, a completely general definition of intelligence, not like intelligence and pigeons or something like that. Yeah. So one problem with goals and rewards is if we're talking about AI systems in particular, if we say, well, it's intelligence is the um, achievement of your goals, then an AI system could just generate an arbitrarily number of, you know, of uh, goals, and then it could instantly achieve them. One of its goals could be changing 1101 to 1000 or something, yeah? Another goal could be an equally arbitrary, you know, transformation of the environment or itself, yeah? So goals are extremely arbitrary. And so trying to measure intelligence by measuring goals and goal, and, uh, goal achievement uh, it will end up, you know, with basically AI systems gaming the measure and, and not actually being very intelligent at the same time, yeah? And the same problem with uh, kind of wireheading, right? I mean, you know, so wireheading is like being able to sort of shortcut uh, the loop through the environment to get the reward. Um, and so just being able to generate the reward directly inter internal to the system, a bit like those rats who kind of endlessly press the lever and, you know, giving themselves hits of dopamine and whatever it was in their brains, yeah? And the other sort of even more problematic issue of goals and rewards is actuators, yeah? So 
if I want to achieve a goal, I've got sort of two things I've got to do, right? I've got to figure out a solution to that, to achieve a way in which I can achieve that goal. And then I've actually got to go out there in the real world and actually achieve the goal. So they get that reward signal from the environment. Yeah. So two systems could be equally smart. They could figure out, you know, the same solution for achieving the goal. But one could be, you know, pathetically weak or something and not be actually, actually be able to carry out, you know, the tasks that needs to be done to get the reward. Yeah. So we could go into this more detail, but roughly speaking, I think there's some deep flaws with this goal reward thing. Yeah. Cognitability, uh, you know, uh, yeah, that's too vague and it's, too, you know, it's, it's sort of uh, self, you know, it begs the question, right? It's defining intelligence in terms of something that's a bit like intelligence and rational thinking. Well, it either boils down to achieving uh, the kind of goals reward thing, right? You know, applying appropriate means to get your ends, yeah? Or it can be just boiled down to being logical or reasonable or something like that. And that's a load of nonsense, right? Because you can write programs that, you know, do nothing and are completely unintelligent, but extremely logical, yeah? There's been a lot of discussion about multiple intelligences, and the idea is that they're not actually reducible to a single intelligence, they're sort of semi-independent, that's what Gardner's view, I think. And Warwick has this view that intelligence is the single thing, it's this high-dimensional space of different abilities. You know, I mean, lousy book, don't read that book, but the actual idea isn't so bad, yeah? And then we, within the intelligence space, we also have the notion of fluid versus crystallized intelligence, yeah? So this is Cattell's distinction. Um, so fluid intelligence is kind of linked to learning or ability to solve new problems, which is also a core sort of feature of intelligence by many people. And then crystallized intelligence is like the reproduction of stored knowledge. Early IQ tests measure, measure both. Modern researchers mostly focus on fluid, this idea that intelligence is like a general property, um, a person's ability to solve new problems regardless of previous education environment. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm just working on a book chapter on this as it happens, but, you know, if you work through it in more detail, basically we don't really have a clear definition of intelligence, yeah? Um, but the good news is we can still measure it in humans um, because we can, we can ground our measures of intelligence in other measures of success, yeah? So we kind of have like a labeled data set in humans of like smart people and not so smart people, yeah? In humans, we have people who like achieve Nobel prizes, and you know, publish ground paper papers and get high, high grades at school. And then we have people who kind of do less of those things, yeah? And so if our intelligence measures correlates um, with those measures of success, um, then we can say, well, maybe you can measure it because we can point to it, even if we don't know what on earth it is, yeah? But this like, lack of clarity really comes to bite us when it comes to artificial intelligence, yeah? So to address these problems, um, I've been sort of working on a new approach to intelligence, which is ideally going to be like a, it's a kind of universal approach to intelligence. And it's based on this idea that intelligence is closely linked to prediction. And so I'm going to make a little bit of a case for that there. So um, one reason for thinking that intelligence is linked to prediction is the predictive brain hypothesis. A lot of you have come across, probably a lot of you have read Clark's book, Surfing Uncertainty, which makes quite a compelling case. It's also kind of Bayesian brain, which is sort of loosely connected with this. And the idea is you have these hierarchical layers in the brain. And instead of like them feeding up, you know, information about edges, if we're talking visual processing, and then the edges, you know, combined into like uh, hand detectors, and then they combined in some other general features, a bit like a deep neural network. The idea is instead that the layers are constantly trying to predict what's happening in layers below, and they're feeding up error signals um, when the, you know, in response to the predictions that are coming down from higher up. Yeah. And so if you buy the predictive brain hypothesis, which I don't necessarily, um, but because there's not really much evidence, but it is kind of compelling and a bit sexy too. But if you buy it, and then the, then you've basically committed to the claim that the core function of the brain is prediction, yeah? That what the brain is doing is just generating predictions, yeah? And if that's the case, then brains that are better predictors should be more intelligent, right? So this, this hypothesis leads to a clear connection between prediction and intelligence, yeah? And that's kind of what started me off on this path already, yeah? And then when it comes to action, right? So we're talking about goals and all this kind of stuff. Well, if you want to achieve your goals, you're not going to get very far unless you can actually predict the consequences of your actions in the environment. Yeah. If you can't predict, you can just, you can't plan. Yeah. I can't, you know, think, well, I'm hungry. Maybe I go to the shops and buy myself some pizza or whatever. And I think of the different shops I might go. That's a, that's a complex series of predictions that I'm making in order to be able to go to the shops and, you know, and finalize my plan and get my goal and get my reward, you know, the pizza from the environment. Yeah. So if you can't predict, you're just going to be hit by the environment in different ways and have these kind of reactive hardwired behaviors. Yeah. And on the other hand, right, if we could have perfect predictive ability, then we'd have like godlike omniscience, right? If I could see the future of the universe for the next billion years, I'd be super smart, right? I'd know exactly what you were going to do tomorrow. I'd know exactly what my cat would do next Tuesday. You know, I'd be able to have, you know, complete, you know, godlike omniscience, right? And so slightly sort of cheesy Nicolas Cage film, if you're interested in this, you know, this guy has like two minutes predictive ability. Yeah, you can see two minutes into the future, not a lot, and it only concerns his own personal well-being. But even in those two minutes, right, he can win any gunfight 
because he knows where all the bullets are going to go. He can, you know, make millions of pounds on gambling and all the rest of it. Even two minutes prediction makes you super smart, you know, and imagine what you have with like, you know, 10 years prediction. Or whatever, yeah? And I think there's a case can be made, you would say, um, for correlation between prediction intelligence and animals, yeah? So we got snails, right? I'm not convinced that the 20,000 neurons in a snail does, has a lot of prediction going on, right? I mean, they can sensitize, they can habituate, but basically their actions are determined by their immediate environment, yeah? Something happens to the snail, it responds in an evolutionary hardwired way that on average leads to the survival of the species, yeah? And then you got sheep, right? So I did a little bit of work on sheep a couple of years back and, you know, but they're kind of smart enough to be able to understand other sheep to a limited extent and maybe make some kind of limited predator prediction, some kind of stuff about paths, probably got some kind of crude forward models going on in sheep. So a little bit of prediction in sheep, I think you make a case for. And then we get to crows and octopi, right? You know, these guys can actually solve complex problems and build tools, right? So if you take the classic uh, Aaron Sloman's kind of example of whatever the name of the crow was that could bend a bit of wire and hook it, hook the, you know, treat up out of the tube, right? That crow has to know how its body actions will change the shape of the metal. That's a prediction problem, right? It has to know, you know, it has to have in mind somehow that this, this tool needs to be made to be able to solve this particular problem. And so it has to be able to predict that when it puts that hook inside that tube, it can actually pull out the reward. Yeah, so it's, so it's getting some limited amount of fairly complex predictions going on in crows, yeah? And then we've got humans, obviously, we've got reactive behaviors, yeah, all the time. But we also do planning based on complex predictions, multiple timescales from global warming to, you know, what I'm going to eat tonight and all that, yeah. Now, that's the sort of case for it. But there's a couple of sort of interesting consequences from it, yeah. So, so some people think that intelligence is this completely abstract property that independent of any environment. So a smart person, right, you know, they could succeed in physics, they could succeed in biology, they could succeed in something else, yeah. Um, so the idea is that we have this amount of intelligence, it's some kind of absolute property, it doesn't matter whether you're in the natural world or studying genomics but databases. Yeah? But prediction is relative to an environment, yeah, we, we can build a hot, you know, super sort of advanced system for weather patterns, but if we fed it, you know, protein folding data, it would just fall over and die and do absolutely nothing, yeah. So no one's developed a completely general prediction system that can outperform systems built for specific environments, right? Our brains have been honed by evolution to work well in hunter-gatherer environments. AI systems process large data sets. They're lousy in hunter-gatherer environments, but they're super smart in these data set environments, yeah? And we are building these systems precisely because we're kind of dumb when it comes to large data sets, yeah? So intelligence is not a completely general property. It's always specific um, to a set of environments. And that's actually a nice consequence, right? Um, because we've got all this stuff from Gardner and, you know, even the sort of stuff work on G, right? It's talking about different components of intelligence. But we don't need to have like musical intelligence, emotional intelligence, all these different types of intelligence, right? We can just say that one particular system has intelligence within this environment, let's say a musical environment, for example, and another system has a high level of predictive intelligence in a chess environment, for example, yeah? We can handle different types of intelligence very neatly by having a single concept of intelligence, i.e. predictive intelligence, and then talking about the environment in which that operates, yeah? And it also broadens our notion of human intelligence, right? Because when, you know, what we're really looking at with IQ tests is intelligence within an academic environment, right? People who get high IQ scores, they're good at mathematical symbols, abstract shapes, all this kind of stuff. And that is why people who do, uh, do well at IQ tests uh, actually you know, achieve all these measures of academic success, school grades, advanced degrees, publication papers, blah, blah, blah. Because within the environment of manipulating symbols and visual rotations and the rest of it, um, they, they excel, and that's why they excel when those tasks, are, when they're doing those tasks in the real world, yeah? But we can also say, well, you know, let's say a good plumber, for example, yeah? You know, they're not necessarily less intelligent, um, but they're intelligent within a different environment, yeah? They're super smart about predicting water flows, you know, pipe cuttings, blah, 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 yeah? So we can talk about intelligence in a much more broad sense um, by having a single concept, i.e. predictive intelligence, and relativizing that to a set of environments. So these are my hypotheses. I actually added another couple this morning, but we'll, we'll stick to these at the moment, yeah? So the first hypothesis is that prediction is the most important component of intelligence. That's what I've been kind of arguing, you know, through the, in the section, yeah? And prediction intelligence are, relevant, are relative to sets of environments, okay? That's because prediction is relative to a set of environments, and therefore, if you buy hypothesis one, also the intelligence is going to be relative to, yeah? And then we get to hypothesis three, which is that the amount of a system's intelligence varies with the number of accurate predictions that it makes in a set of environments, yeah? So this kind of follows, sort of in a way, from the first two, right? If you can make loads and loads of accurate, non-trivial predictions, just like, uh, you know, Nicolas Cage in Knowing or God, right? Um, then you're going to be smarter than someone who can make a few trivial predictions. That's the idea. Yeah? Okay, so that's the, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, theoretical sweep, if you like. And if you buy these hypotheses, 
um, we can then you know, devise an algorithm that will measure intelligence very precisely. Currently, it only works in artificial systems. We've got full access to the internal states, but I can say a little bit about how we could apply it to natural systems. Uh, okay, so in theory, we can apply this algorithm uh, to any system at all. Um, and so in theory, we could use this algorithm to compare the intelligence of humans and sheep's AIs, et cetera, in sets of environments. So to sort of, as a sort of plausibility study, I've implemented it, um, as I'll show you on a web page, and it'll, it measures you know, in real time pretty much the intelligence of the agent as it explores the maze environment, learns about it, and also I applied it to a machine learning algorithm that does time series prediction. So I'll just sort of talk you through it. I mean, I'm gonna skim over the mathematical details because you know, it's too complicated, it doesn't really matter anyway. You can always read the paper uh, if you're interested. So we've got an agent, so, this, so it needs tweaking a bit depending on whether you're measuring an agent in an environment or whether you're measuring a machine learning algorithm. I'll say a little bit about that, but it's the same principles. You just have to, the actual, you have to, when you boil it down to actually applying to a concrete system, you have to do a few adjustments, yeah? So we've got an agent, right? Simple agent, classic stuff, right? And then uh, this agent has these input states, I, I1, I2, I3, and I4, and these input states vary over time. So this is the state of the input states at time zero. And then at time one, you know, they have a different state. And at time two, they have a different state. Yeah. So as it interacts with the environments, the sensors change the state of the, the input state to the agent. Yeah. And as it's interacting with this environment, if it's an intelligent agent rather than just a snail, um, it's going to be generating time index predictions about its future internal states. These might be simple. It might be saying, well, the next time state, but this internal state is going to have this value. Or it might be like humans, they're predicting that in, you know, whatever it is, six billion years, the Earth will be swallowed by the sun, right? We're saying that a certain thing will happen at a certain point in time, yeah? And to sort of get the most general case, um, these uh, predictions are probability distributions, yeah? So when we're making predictions, we're not normally saying it to the picosecond or whatever, right? We're saying that these predictions will happen within this loose time frame. And in the case of six billion years, maybe it's six billion one years, maybe it's you know whatever five, you know what six billion minus one is, right? We're making approximate predictions both in values and time, and that's why it's like a probability distribution, either a continuous probability distribution or one that has a sort of discrete set of values. Yeah. So at this point in time, um, this agent um, is making these probabilistic predictions, right? And at different points in time, it's generating different predictions as it interacts with the environment. Yeah? So if we want to measure the predictive intelligence of the agent, we can compare its predictions um, that it's made with what actually happens to its internal states at a later point in time. Yeah? So for example, this is at time zero. I hope you can see the mouse. Um, it's predicting that at time two, for example, uh, it'll have this sort of state. Yeah? And it's making some probability distribution about that. And then we can compare that prediction um, with what actually happens to the input state at that later point in time. So we've got a kind of ground truth uh, for these predictions, yeah? So, to, so what we need to do to get its accuracy as predictions is somehow compare this probability distribution with this probability distribution, yeah? Which in fact will just now come down to a sort of single value, but we can still treat it as a probability distribution. So I use Hellinger distance um, to measure the distance between discrete probability distributions. So there's other tools like pullback, Lieber, divergence, and this kind of stuff, but I, only, I need a value that ends up with a value between, I need a value between one and naught, basically, so we can sum them cleanly, yeah? So Helliger distance does that nicely with, with discrete probability distributions. Don't worry about the details. We have to like do one minus because it, Helliger distance gives us one where there's a mismatch. So we need to subtract it from one to get the actual value between naught and one for the accuracy of the match, yeah? And continuous distributions, um, this is what I had to do with the time series data. I had to put like an error bounds on it and then look for the intersection between uh, the standard normal distribution and the and the sort of error bounds distribution. And then the overlap there is the is the accuracy of the prediction. Yeah. We also have to get rid of random guesses. Yeah. So when I first implemented this, I didn't really think about this too clearly, but an agent can actually just generate random guesses that are quite sensible. Um, that will give it a certain level of intelligence that actually is not really intelligence at all. Yeah, it's just some random guessing. Yeah, so we need to subtract random guessing um, from the prediction match and take the absolute value to avoid sort of tricky negative stuff. Yeah, so again, the, don't know too much about the details, but in this uh, in this one, the random guess here is like an even distribution across all the values within a range, and then we subtract this square here from the match here, basically. Yeah? So what we do, the agent goes explores its environment. We assume a complete exploration of the environment at the moment. It makes lots of predictions and we sum up those predictions to get the prediction match how accurately the agent is predicting its environment yeah so the first problem we might have is that the agent could produce lots of trivial predictions that come true yeah so if it's it can make very very simple predictions even about itself and then if we sum them up we might end up with a large value of intelligence yeah so a lot like uh, leg and hutter's uh, work 
what we do is multiply the sum of the prediction match by the compressibility of the predictions, yeah? So Kolmogorov complexity is like a measure of complexity where the complexity is something like the shortest string describing something, yeah? Um, but you can't calculate in practice, so most people use compression to actually calculate, you know, what is that shortest string? And so compressibility, I don't know if I've got it here, is the, um, the shortest string length achieved with a compression algorithm divided by the original length, yeah? So we multiply the prediction match by the compressibility to, get, to eliminate all these trivial predictions, yeah? So this is all this is saying really is we're summing up the prediction match throughout the environment and multiplying by the compressibility. And then we take the log because otherwise we're gonna have trouble comparing the intelligence of a simple agent like the one I've just described with a human intelligence and with super intelligence, right? We need to sort of squish it down a bit and that's what the log does for us, yeah? And the final thing we might wanna do is we wanna sum the intelligence across multiple environments, right? If we're working with agents, they have different maze environments, for example. And so we need to sort of sum the intelligence across the, a specific set of environments. But then environments could differ in really trivial ways, right? A single bit difference or something like that. So again, we need to multiply by the compressibility when we're summing across environments. So if the environments are almost the same, then the sum, the, then C over L in this case, will approximate a half. Yeah, we're not actually adding much intelligence because we're summing up multiple very similar environments where the environments are very different Then this will approximate to one. And then we're actually genuinely summing the intelligence across multiple environments. So the letter I'm using for this is uh, called Payorth or Perth or Pertho, depending on how you use it. I'm quite into runes at the moment. I use it a while back in the paper. And uh, again, we're bored of Greek letters anyway, right? Um, so, so Payorth um, is the Old Norse letter that corresponds to P. So it's obviously got the P prediction thing. But it's also got, you know, runes have this kind of mystical meaning and the meaning um, of uh, payoff is like the dice cup, chance, secrets, destiny in the future, right? So kind of quite appropriate, I thought, yeah? So payoff sub, sub, uh, subscript C is for crystallized intelligence and then defining fluid intelligence as the rate of change of crystallized intelligence. Yeah, so it's a nice simple sort of way of putting these two things together, yeah? So I've tested this um, on an agent exploring different maze environments. I'm not gonna do a demo because that probably takes too long, but I'll show you the web page and you know, the different bits. And then I also put together a deep network, this time series prediction. Yeah, so, ah, wait a minute, now I'm gonna hit a problem actually. Uh, I'm gonna have to reshare, just give me a sec, yeah. Uh, let me just share my screen actually. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, I might have to reshare and deshare. Can you see that guys? Can you see that? Yep, yeah. okay, cool. So this is the website, so davidgomez.pi, I'll give you at the end, yeah. Um, and then, so that's just, there's papers and stuff, any new papers I'll put up there, yeah. And so here's the agent maze experiment. So what you can do, you've got like different mazes, like U maze or whatever, and you can sort of let the agent explore the maze and it'll, it'll calculate the real, it's sort of moving the agent through all the possible permutations of the maze. It's giving you the prediction match and the intelligence over time. And it takes a while for the fluid intelligence to be calculated, which I'm not gonna bother doing now um, because it's the rate of change and I need a, I'm using a polynomial approximation for that, but don't worry about that, yeah. So if you play around with it, you can see the changing intelligence of the agent. And then I've got the machine learning experiments. So now you can actually run deep learning in the browser, which is rather nice. Actually, let's get rid of that for a moment. Um, so we've got different data sets. You know, you've got a coronavirus uh, data set, a weather, Heathrow, coronavirus, or whatever. So you basically pick a data set when I've done that right, and you build it, and it basically works in the same way. You can build the network, and you can run it over. It does take a while to build, and probably because of Zoom and all that. Uh, yeah, there we go, yeah. And then you can basically run and train the network, and it see the evolving intelligence over time, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go back and finish this off because I'm, um, yeah, I'm back, so I'm not too far off time, but okay, all right. So have a look anyway, and a play if you're interested, yeah. Okay, so applications, right? So obviously, one of the key things we want to do is compare intelligence across species, right? That's a sort of big topic, universal measure intelligence we put forward to do this, um, but I think this does this a whole lot better, yeah? We can compare natural and artificial intelligence. Applying payoff to natural systems is a little tricky, right? So we either have to dive inside the brain, that would work, or we need to devise tests that enable us to estimate uh, predictive intelligence from external behavior. Yeah, so either will work, uh, one's probably more accurate than the other. Yeah? It also enables us to pin down what artificial intelligence is much more precisely. Yeah, so AI is like, it's this very sort of all encompassing term, which really means, you know, mimicking stuff that humans do that may perhaps require a bit of intelligence. You know, so we've got face recognition systems, self-driving cars, chatbox, cognitive systems, so on and so forth, yeah. But some of these AIs like chatbox are not smart at all, right? They're just pattern matching, yeah. Some are classifiers, we could go into this more detail. There's a lot of reasons for thinking that classification is actually not a component of intelligence, but some of these systems actually do predictions like game playing systems, cognitive robots, self-driving cars, yeah. So 
what we can do is we can actually separately classify, class, we can actually create, you know, we can actually identify the systems that are genuinely artificially intelligent and separate those off from others, from systems that are merely Im imitating human behavior, so we're saying, yeah? And obviously we can actually measure the intelligence of these systems. So once we've figured out which systems are actually AI systems, um, then we can actually do this stuff about regulation. You know, there's all this worries about, you know, the expansion of AI in an uncontrolled way. So we've, to regulate that, right, we could measure the intelligence of these systems and then say, okay, in the areas of cybersecurity, we were only going to allow systems that have, you know, a payoff value of a thousand or whatever it is. Yeah. There's a lot of discussion about white boxing AI. So again, we can use payoff as a way of doing that. And also, you know, if you're desperate to protect jobs, then you could limit the intelligence of AI systems within certain areas like call centers and something like that. Yeah. Philosophy of science. And so again, this, in the early work I did on this, I thought quite a lot about this. So Popper has this idea um, that the ideal scientific theory is a strong scientific theory that can generate lots of falsifiable predictions, right? So this opens the way of actually measuring the intelligence of scientific theories um, in exactly the way I described, right? So we could rank, compare them. And then there's a lot of work on computational scientific discovery, right? Discovering new scientific theories using computers, yeah? So if you've got uh, a feedback uh, signal of how good the theory is, then you can use that as part of the computational uh, scientific discovery. Yeah? And the other aspect of this is we might actually, we could actually use a measure of intelligence such as the one I've described um, to produce more intelligent systems, right? So if we, for example, we're doing genetic algorithms, we can evolve, we can use the uh, measure of intelligence as a feedback signal to the genetic algorithm or reinforcement learning algorithm and use that to produce systems that are more intelligent within that particular environment, yeah? So people talk about, you know, so obviously the, you know, the rather flippant thing is, oh yeah, we'll, we'll generate systems that take over the world and destroy humanity. Well, that's only if we have an uncontrolled expansion of intelligence uh, within the human environment, and that's a very, very long way off as it is, yeah? So I'm actually running a student project on this. I doubt he'll destroy the world, but, you know, never know your luck, right? Okay, um, so good reasons thinking that intelligence uh, linked to a system's ability to make accurate predictions. Yeah, I've given you my three hypotheses, which I think are pretty reasonable, personally, and so I'm still in the process of refining these. Um, I've given you the algorithm, because once you've got these hypotheses, you can measure intelligence accurately. And I think there's a lot of um, interesting applications in psychology of computer science, yeah? So there's a paper there, there's a sort of author version on my website, probably also on that website I've just given you, um, that gives you sort of the overview. I'm improving this considerably. I'm trying to write like a single decent paper on this, but I, it's work in progress, probably six months of the way I'm going. But have a look at that if you're interested in the, the, an early version of the article and some of the theory behind it. You can play around with the website. It's all just on there, davidgammers.eu PI. A few references there, and I guess we'll do the collective questions at the end. But anyway, those are the two links you need to remember, yeah? That's me. And my slides. Okay, everyone has the, do you have the slides up? Cool. Okay. Um, <clears throat> One preliminary note, I have not uploaded my slides, but in case there is interest, I uh, can upload them afterwards. I just have to tweak them a little bit and add some references. Um, so I've been trying to work out a few different um, philosophical arguments about the significance of uh, recent, the recent use of deep neural networks in um, neuroscience. And uh, I'm not entirely happy with any of the arguments I've worked out. Um, in, in the initial abstract I wrote here, I talk a lot about the philosophy of science topic, um, model templates, and the, uh, the idea that you can transfer uh, a computa computational template from an abstract computational system implemented in a computer to a biological brain. Um, in this version of this talk, I'm going to set that stuff, that philosophy of science stuff aside a little bit. And I've, uh, it's turned into something a bit more metaphysical. Um, sorry, I'm not forwarding. Why is it not forward? Ah, okay. Okay, so there's been this flood of work recently uh, comparing deep neural networks to biological ones um, and most of the people actually doing this work view it as a kind of scientific model. But um, at the end of the day, there's often a discussion, you know, when you go to the bar after a conference about whether um, 
this kind of modeling work that comes from within the neurosciences will be a part of or merge with or be an aid to the development of artificial intelligence research. And the boundaries are of course pretty fuzzy. Um, <clears throat> now, if you look at this work from the perspective of um, a set of developments towards improved artificial intelligence, and if you also think that these developments are, you know, if, if you're optimistic about the uh, insights offered by models of this kind, then I think you are buying into a form of functionalism about the mind. Um, so my plan in the talk is to articulate a brand of functionalism that's appropriate to this vision, and then to set up an argument that challenges it. Okay. Um, the sort of philosophical big picture here is uh, explicitly metaphysical. Um, <clears throat> many of the philosophers here will uh, recognize this quote from Hilary Putnam, we could be made of Swiss cheese and it wouldn't matter. Here's another quote um, that expresses more of a materialist sentiment from Aristotle, uh, for if one defines the operation of sawing as a certain kind of dividing and it cannot come about unless the saw has teeth of a certain kind and these cannot be unless it's iron. So um, <clears throat> there is uh, an old and, and still active um, debate between functionalists and, and materialists. And um, I'm trying to sort of situate the recent developments in deep learning into that, into that sort of philosophical history. Okay. Um, I should also probably say that uh, there are all kinds of debates going on at the moment about whether deep learning is um, generating profound insights into the way that minds and brains work, or whether they are um, sort of data consumption devices that memorize the rather large data sets that they're trained on and therefore aren't really showing us any new tricks about um, how to do perception or how to do cognition. And I'm sort of more on the profound insights team. Um, and I just wanted to say that because uh, otherwise this, this talk has more of a negative um, attitude. Okay, so this slide uh, is from a recent uh, paper uh, with, a, with a nice title, um, if deep learning is the answer, then what is the question? And, and this is just summarizing some of the work that tries to compare um, the activation uh, inside uh, a deep neural network with uh, representations or neural activations, both in humans and in, in monkeys. Um, there's, there's a whole lot here, um, I won't try to describe any of it in detail because it would take a lot of time, but just uh, if you look at A and B there, I'll just quickly describe two. Um, in, in figure A, you have uh, simple and complex cells, and it turns out that when you train a convolutional neural network of the right type, it automatically, uh, on an object recognition kind of task, it will automatically develop something like the receptive fields that you see in V1 in mammals. And then um, in B, you have uh, representational similarity matrices, which display or represent the similarity uh, between populations of neural activity. Um, and the degree to which those populations of neural activity are activated in a way that um, recapitulates the intermediate layers in a deep convolutional neural network. Okay, there's lots of stuff of this type. Okay, now um, this work would not be particularly interesting unless uh, it was predictively successful, and indeed it is. Um, it's predictively successful in, in two ways, behaviorally and neurally. So um, these deep neural networks are trained in an end-to-end -end manner. 
Um, that means uh, the parameter settings like the weights are um, decided by uh, the, the, the task that, that they go through and after training, um, they can match or in some cases even exceed human performance on uh, let's say a thousand way object recognition task where the objects are depicted against natural scene backgrounds, just to take one example. Okay, so it's only very recently that um, neural networks have been able to uh, beat humans at object recognition tasks. Um, so so that's, that's in a sense a prediction, right? They are behaving in just the way that, um, that humans do. And importantly, this is not the case in, 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 in many uh, types of neural networks, but in some, it's the case that they can replicate not only the performance, you know, how, how accurate people are, but also the profile of errors. So the errors you make in, in making you know, judgments about whether an object is a member of this class or not, or whether a photograph represents an object of this class or not, um, are not randomly distributed, right? They have a particular shape, the error profile, and that shape is replicated by the deep neural network. So that, that suggests that um, it's not a, well, it suggests that there's some sort of interesting similarity at least. Uh, more interesting than that are the neural predictions. Uh, it turns out that the latest, um, deep convolutional neural networks uh, are better quantitative models of neural responses um, in visual and auditory cortex, both in monkeys and in humans. Um, they're better than models that are specifically designed to make predictions of that kind. And the, the surprising thing here you see in the third bullet point is that they're not really, or there's a sense in which they're not designed to make predictions of that kind. Um, now, this last point is a little bit tricky, but uh, no brain data is used to tune the parameters of these models. Um, no human data is, is used. So they're trained um, entirely on a task, which is identical to a task that humans um, will perform, but um, no, no information about the way that humans perform it, either behaviorally or neurally, is allowed to influence the manner in which these neural networks um, tune their parameters because that process is fully automated. Um, so you could say that these brain-like internal activation patterns emerge from the behavioral training from the outside in. Um, the scientists don't have uh, their hand on the scales, as it were. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it may also be worth noting that uh, in their multiple realization book of 2016, um, Shapiro and Polger explicitly say that we can just ignore discussions of multiple realization in which one realizer is biological and the other realizer is made out of silicon because um, there just are no cases that are remotely close to compelling. Um, but you know, maybe, maybe these cases are pretty compelling. Um, okay, so here's, here's the idea that I'll just call network functionalism. It's not really a new idea, but I think maybe the particular way I'm formulating it is, is new. So if we can demonstrate what I'll call a double mapping from an artificial uh, network to a biological one over some temporal interval, then the operation carried out by the biological network over that interval is realized by the artificial network rather than merely simulated by it, right? So the double mapping is a sufficient condition for turning a simulation into a realization. What is a double mapping? Well, it's just what I talked about on the last slide. Basically, it's when you have um, a, an artificial system that can reproduce the input output, the behavioral profile of a person or a monkey or whatever, um, but it can also reproduce the internal activation patterns. And I'm here swapping between the reproducing phrasing and the prediction phrasing, but I take them to be equivalent. Um, 
And since this double mapping is, a, is supposed to be a sufficient condition, network functionalism entails a strong form of multiple realizability, which crosses the, what you might call the carbon silicon divide. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, if you want to evaluate whether this, this idea is, um, has got legs or not, um, you have to uh, look specifically at the second kind of mapping. Um, oh, I wanted to make one other point on the last slide, which is just that this idea of network functionalism is kind of similar to Andy Clark's notion of microfunctionalism, which he defended in a book called Microcognition, uh, which was part of the connectionist debates in the late 1980s. Um, anyway, so this double mapping. Um, now, neural networks are um, known to be universal function approximators. So in a sense, we already knew that there exists a possible deep neural network that can replicate human input output profiles, because you can just conceptualize those as a mathematical function from stimuli to judgments about the stimuli. So that's sort of the less surprising part. The more interesting, more surprising part is the internal activation mapping, right? We don't have any um, proofs that, that such a mapping should exist, right? This is like an interesting empirical finding. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so here's the, the, the crucial, insight. Um, because deep neural networks are formal objects in a sense, a mapping between the internal activation of a DNN and of a biological network can only be defined formally by means of something like, say, a correlation coefficient. And this contrasts with the diagrammatic kind of mappings that are typically assumed to be available in previous discussions of multiple realization. Okay, so um, this is a pretty casual uh, idea, diagrammatic mapping. Um, <clears throat> so just to give you an example of what I have in mind here, you've got on the left side, uh, a picture of a vertebrate eye, and on the right side, you have a picture of a cephalopod eye, and you can see that they're really similar. Um, one of the maybe most important differences is that um, in the cephalopod case, uh, the axons in the retina are pointing out, and in the vertebrate case, they're pointing in, which causes the axons to have to wrap around in, in the vertebrate case, and that creates the blind spot, which uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of. Um, but you know, they're both camera eyes. So this is, you can argue about whether this is a genuine case of multiple realization or not, but the point of this slide is just to show that it's, um, it's sort of easy to line up these two cases and identify the properties that make it a candidate for multiple realization in a sort of diagrammatic way. You're allowed in this kind of case to appeal to spatial properties like shape and location. But of course you can add to that. You can also appeal to historical properties um, and uh, material properties, right? There are lots of different sort of uh, dimensions of similarity in, in these two cases. Um, but nothing like that diagrammatically uh, grounded mapping is available when you're dealing with a formal object. Um, so uh, what you have to do is instead um, make the mapping exclusively quantitative. Um, and, and my claim is that this quantitative formal mapping is, is unavoidable. So here's just an example to illustrate um, <clears throat> what, what you actually do when you um, try to find this mapping or equivalently make this prediction. Um, so this is from a paper by Kell et al. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a study with humans and, and audition rather than vision. Um, and I just chose it because it's like relatively easy to understand. Some of the stuff is quite complicated. Um, so in this study, they trained a convolutional neural network to identify um, music genres in short clips, and then also to discriminate words in, in recordings of human speech. Um, and they're using su supervised learning. Um, the trained network achieves human level performance on the task. Um, then they add some variations. And one variation, they introduce noise to force both the humans and the neural networks to make errors. And then they show that the errors um, in the neural network 
mirror in a surprising way the errors in, in the human performance. So that's the behavioral match. And then um, they also introduce a set of novel sounds that were not included in the training data. Um, and they look at the activation patterns that result in the DNN and compare it with fMRI and show that you can um, predict activity in human auditory cortex as measured by fMRI with the activity in the deep neural network. And again, this is a case where there's no human data involved, right? It's end-to-end -end automated training. Um, now, here's, a, here's sort of a, a diagram that represents the experiment and, and the crucial thing here is that um, there are a whole bunch of decisions that have to be made before you get to that result where you take a Pearson correlation coefficient um, in order to uh, measure the similarity between uh, the neural network and the biological data set. So you, you build this neural network, which um, it might be worth also mentioning very briefly. How am I on time, by the way? I've got, Henry, Henry how am I doing on time? I don't know how late I'm allowed to um, I think I, I, if you wrap up in the next five minutes or so, then we'll leave us a couple minutes for questions. Okay, good. Yeah, I do want questions. Um, so quickly, um, what you do is uh, you pick the layer in the convolutional network where whole sounds starting uh, get discriminated rather than individual features. So there's a decision right there, which, you know, which layer are you um, looking at? And then you look at average activity in that layer for each sound that you present. And that gives you a vector. Then you go over to the brain side and you look at a particular voxel in the brain and you look at its activity for each sound that gives you another vector. And then you look for correlations between those vectors. And you repeat that process for every vector in auditory cortex. So you've got this voxel wise um, comparison looking for which parts of auditory cortex are best predicted by the network. And, and, and the point here is just that there are lots of ways to do this, right? You could do it in a voxel wise manner, but you could also do it in a distributed manner using um, MVPA or something. So there's a lot, um, to be a bit superficial, uh, there are a lot of data modeling decisions here. And, um, the need to engage in those data modeling decisions is not a special feature of this example. Um, all comparisons between networks and brains um, have to make choices about how to represent the data. And data modeling judgments um, introduce new degrees of freedom into the methods we have for identifying a mapping between two systems with respect to a particular psychological operation. And um, crucially, uh, although these judgments are not personal, right? I'm not being um, a wild subjectivist about how science works. They're made on empirical grounds. Nevertheless, they're not interest-free, right? Data modeling decisions depend on which scientific questions you want to ask. Um, <clears throat> and the degrees of freedom introduced by data modeling judgments introduce the possibility of identifying and mapping on the cheap, as it were in a manner that reminds us of trivia, triviality arguments against functionalism. So um, those arguments are pretty complicated, but the, the gist of it is that you find a system that patently fails to realize the operation in question, and then you show that you can transform a description of that system into one that satisfies the mapping criterion. Okay, and then because the mapping criterion is intended to serve as a sufficient condition for realization, you show that functionalism is so liberal as to be trivialized. So as a matter of fact, there are alternative neural networks that perform markedly worse on behavioral measures and therefore fail to realize the same input output profile um, <clears throat> as the, the one that we might take as a candidate. Uh, but which nevertheless come within 5% of the performance on the internal activation prediction. And this I'm taking from this uh, paper, which I, I don't think is even quite published yet, but it's already gotten a lot of traction on the bioarchive by uh, Schrimpf et al. Um, and these results strike me as, as quite analogous to triviality arguments against functionalism, which have been made um, sort of periodically since the 1970s. 
Um, <clears throat> yeah. So to, um, to block triviality arguments in general, functionalism needs to be supplemented with additional constraints on what counts as a realizer. But because data modeling judgments are and ought to be motivated by the nature of a scientific question um, at hand in a particular case, it's not clear that you can do this in a sufficiently general way. So here's sort of my conclusion, this third bullet point. Either we supply, either the defender of network functionalism must supply an interest-free justification for data modeling judgments, or we should give up on the idea of network functionalism because it succumbs to a kind of triviality argument. Um, and I think this pushes at least a little bit towards a much more general idea, which is that it's unlikely that a silicon computer running a deep neural network can realize um, in some precise sense, the same psychological operation as a biological brain. Okay, so here's just a summary of the argument I've given. Uh, network functionalism says that the double mapping suffices for sameness of psychological operation. Um, second point, the internal mapping has to be quantitative. Third point, quantitative mapping entails data modeling judgments. Data modeling judgments invite triviality style arguments. Conclusion, either we supply interest neutral justification for those judgments or give up on this idea of network functions. Okay, that's it. Thank you.